Let me see. Kate, what are the last minute tips to make 2021 a success? Last minute tip for 2021? I just think, I, I, you know what happens to me every year, Christian, which is like, I always think, leave it out all out on the field. I, I was an athlete. I didn't play on field. I'm a basketball player, but I always, I always think about it, like leave it all out on the field for sure. Like there's, you're only going to get one shot, squeeze it all in, get as much in as you can. What's your tip? Uh, I think the, the one thing we talked about is like yesterday, with, specifically with the sales team, we talked about like, is there a work back plan that you can still introduce into mm -hmm. your deals? And it might already be a little bit close, um, but if kind of like, okay, let's target 31st, which means when do we need to do what? When are you out? I think that's that's the last minute thing we're trying. Yeah, I love that. I love that. The work back plans are a big thing we're working with our sales team on too. Uh, we work back plan, close plan, all those things, like right? But have a plan. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is that it's also in the interest of the buyer. I mean, if I want to buy a product, I want to get it as soon as possible. Like if I'm buying, I want it, I want it tomorrow and I want it to get started like the day after. And so I think it's really and, and that's sometimes like not the mindset, but it's it's actually in the interest of both of us. And then like how can we navigate the organization getting it done? Yeah. Yeah. So true. But yeah, there's a few days during Christmas. Hard to navigate. I think especially like as a European, I think that that is specifically hard to, uh, I think Europe is off starting on the 23rd. Yes, you all are much better than we are here about being off. Like you call it, you're like, I'm done, I'm out. You know, whereas like, I feel like in the US, it's like, you don't know who's in, you don't know who's out, where is everybody, what's going on, are they working, are they not working, it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. No, I think in, like in, in Austria, it's completely like, these two weeks, 24 to 6, they're off for everyone. And in a sense, that's actually good, as yeah. long as there's no lockdown this year, which just ended in Austria. Oh, did you just get out of it in Austria? That's interesting. I know the UK is like going back in it. Yeah. Back yeah. in it, like pseudo way. It's like, you should lock, you should not, if you can, you should not leave your house, but you know, not official like lock it down yet. Yeah, no, um, Austria. I mean, I think the getting out this weekend, um, but it's, it was like no restaurants, no hotels even. Wow. All right, Christian, should we do it? We've got people here. They're, yes. are they eager people. to hear what you have to say, sir. <laughs> they they want to hear what you have to say. So perfect, I'll kick it off. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Today we'll talk about uh, the great resignation, like a topic, we've heard it everywhere, but it's really on everybody's mind because I think it, everyone feels it, that people are changing left and right. Maybe some of you already just recently changed. And what we are gonna talk about is how to actually like take the great resignation and turn it into pipeline and revenue. And so in terms of speakers, um, I, my name is Christian Kletzel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of UserChamps. So at UserChamps, we can track your existing champions and power users for job changes. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the playbooks of how to turn this into revenue. And then very excited to also have Kate Adams here. She's SVP of marketing for validity. Maybe say a quick word yeah, about absolutely. you and validity. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, so uh, Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Validity. Validity um, has a number of different products, some of which you may or may have uh, heard of before, Demand Tools, Bright Verify, uh, Return Path 250 OK, and Everest. Our whole premise is around uh, the idea that we believe that everything starts with good quality data, data that lets you engage, convert, and uh, service your customers better than you ever have been able to before. And so that's why I'm super excited about this topic uh, to discuss with you today, Christian, and, and really get into the weeds here. Yeah, so and I think, I mean, this topic was, was already super important in the last like, many years, but it has never been as important as now with the great resignation. I think you also have some awesome data that, that we're gonna share in a second. So if we wanna jump, so what are we gonna talk about? real quick talk about the great resignation we've all heard it but just share a little bit more what we've seen and then um talk about the implications of this of um like what happens to my data why is this important and then we'll go into playbooks to talk about how can we from the marketing 
marketing side or sales side take advantage of the great resignation and turn this into opportunities and revenue for us. And then we'll have, like, well, we'll send out this deck, but we'll also share additional resources, both from the validity and the user term side of where you can get more information here. And then very importantly, we also have a Q&A. Um, we're gonna manage the chat. You can either uh, directly write into the chat or reach out to us with any questions that you're having or any comments. And, and we're gonna address this either directly during or afterwards. Uh, good, talking about the great resignation. I think what, what, what's really interesting for me, like we started talking about, about the resignation already at the beginning of 2021. Like we've heard about the, the statistics and then in a sense, we saw it in full force starting you know, in August. At least it, it started to feel real for me. Like 4.3 million Americans quit their job in August. That's the highest number ever. And in total in 2022, 64% think about changing. And I think ultimately the number will come down to probably around 40%. But on our end, like we saw it with pretty much every customer every opportunity, you have people either joining or leaving. And we see a lot of these implications. What, what uh, does this mean to my customer if my champion leaves? What does this mean to my, um, to my existing opportunity if my champion leaves or if my detractor leaves? And what does it mean in terms of pipeline generation if, if someone joins my customer or my opportunity? And then just looking at our own data, I mean, 2020 was a low year in terms of job changes, but we already see in like at the beginning of 2021, we saw 20% more. And that's not like, and, and that means that um, there was a low number of changes, like in the probably around 10% range of people changing their job. This year, it's 20% more, which means they get 30% changing their job. And ultimately, and at the end of the year, we'll arrive at the around 40%. And this will mean that in 2021, it will be higher than any other year before COVID. And now um, handing it over to Kate, uh, who generated a lot of really interesting data around um, how valuable it is to have up-to-date information in your CRM. Yeah, thanks, Christian. So Christian, I think the data that you guys have on the Great Resignation, like that's astounding, right? 64% of Americans gonna change their job for whether that, that ends up at 40% or not, like that, those numbers are huge. Like it's unreal. I've never seen anything like it. And, and you know, everybody's talking about the Great Resignation. Another uh, term that I've, that I've heard thrown around, uh, around it has been this, the silver tsunami, which is a personal favorite of, of one of our, of, of our product marketer here at uh, Validity, but people are changing jobs and then also just retiring, just exiting the workforce completely the, the entire time, right? So we're referring to all those folks that are just saying like, hey, I'm done, like, thanks so much. I'm gonna ride off into the sunset here. Um, so yeah, so you referenced, we've got some data here. Uh, little secret for everybody on the webinar, I pried this out of the hands of my content team. This is like hot off the presses. I don't even think the survey is actually completely, completely done yet. We're still looking for a couple more respondents, but this is hot off the presses. They definitely are, they're working arduously to put the report together and findings on it. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna need this for this presentation today. So uh, I stole it. The team's not gonna be happy about it, but I did it for you. Just remember that. So a um, couple things. So why does data matter? Like, why does any of this actually matter to us? Why, why are we talking about this right now? Well, 91% of respondents of our survey, we, just under a thousand organizations responded to the survey. This is US-based data. We also will have a, a UK and APAC version of this data as well. But 91% of people say they rate their CRM system and the data in it as either important or very important, right? So that's straight from organizations themselves. So 91% are saying like, hey, our data in our CRM is super important. 75% of them agree that data is actually the lifeblood of their company and a key dr growth driver. That's huge, right? Like, and, and I am really heartened to see that because we've been talking about uh, for a long time or uh, at Validity around like data as your most important asset. It is your most important business asset, right? It doesn't matter what products you have, what service you deliver, what the team you created here is, if you don't have the data on the people that you service and the people that you wanna sell to, it doesn't, like you are going nowhere, right? You're on the hamster wheel to nowhere. 
But then 82% of people use their data to differentiate themselves and gain a competitive advantage, right? So I love that so many more organizations are starting to realize that their data is so important uh, and that it is, it is critical, their lifeblood, right, to their organization. They also are saying it's essential for building and maintaining those customer relationships, which is like, if you don't have, so not only the reason why data is so important is so that you can build those relationships with your current and future customers, right? Everything is about relationships. Now, if you are in B2B, B2C, if you are selling something to someone, it is no longer good enough of like, it's just a transaction. We're just transacting money and we're out, right? No, it's like people are buying on relationships now. I When I buy software as uh, in my business life, right? I am always thinking about, is this person just gonna buy, just gonna sell me something and then they're riding off into the sunset and I will never hear from them until day number 364 when they want me to sign on the dotted line for that renewal, right? Like, <laughs> no, I wanna make sure that this person is in it to win it for me, that everything they sold me on upfront in the sales process, they're actually going to deliver on later on through or over the course of this entire agreement, right? So. 96% of people of respondents to our survey agree that accurate CRM data improves their conversion rates, right? That's like a no brainer, right? If the data is not accurate, how in the world are you gonna have your SDR, BDR, ADR, LDR, MDR, whatever acronym you're using at your organization, how are you gonna have them uh, start a conversation with folks for your sales team, right? 75% of them agree that maintaining CRM data quality is essential to building strong uh, customer relationships, yeah. right? I, so, I, I want to jump into what you said about yeah. specifically this, where it's like, we, we always think about lifetime value of a company, like of a customer, but I think more and more we should be thinking about the lifetime value of a person, which then comes back to the relationship of the individual. If you have people specifically now, like if they change every two years and they buy you at every company, then their lifetime value of this one person is probably higher than the lifetime value of the company they work with at the first in, in their first job. Yeah, I love that. I love that way of thinking. And that would be uh, super interesting, Christian. I'd love to like to jam on that and geek out on that with you for a long period of time. Cause every you're right, everybody's thinking about LTV of a customer. And when they say customer, they don't mean person, they just mean account. And one of the things that I talked about for a long time is like, Guess what? No account is signing anything for you. It's a person, right? It's not user, user gems. It's not going to pick up some pen somewhere and sign on the dotted line. It it's is. Christian. It's Trinity Absolutely. that are going to sign on that dotted line. I love that idea of LTV of a person because I think that's so that's so critical. And I think there's a way to tie that in with like NPS data. We could really geek out on yeah, that calculation. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, and then the last piece here is eight in 10 of those people say that data quality is essential to delivering great customer experiences, right? So everybody knows, like these folks are saying super important, critical for us, competitive differentiated, differentiator, and it, it's essential for us to have relationships with our customers and for us to book revenue, right? But there is a ton of room for improvement, right? So everybody's saying like, oh my God, it's so important. I, it's so critical. We can't live without it. We cannot convert anybody without it. We can't have good customer relationships without it. But 21% uh, of people estimate that less than 50% of the data in their company CRM is accurate and complete. Like think about that for a minute. I mean, that's the that's the forty percent that change, right? Like, if you did not update your Salesforce, like if you don't specifically look for this, it means just the forty percent of people changing means that half your Salesforce data is outdated. Yeah. Exactly, right? So, like, you can flip a coin, and they're saying like it, that it's accurate or inaccurate. That's about as good as it's going to get when it comes to the CRM. That is so painful to me, but your data solidifies like exactly why that is, Christian. Yeah, yeah. and I think that means I'm. I'm probably losing trust. Like at some point, like as, at a certain percentage, it just means as me as a rep or, or me in marketing is like, I don't even go into the CRM anymore because if I can flip a coin, it's better time spent. I, I see where I can get the data from somewhere else. Exactly. I'll just go on LinkedIn. Why do yeah. I need to bother with my CRM? No. Right. And, and as a marketer or a salesperson 
or whatever you are on the line, that that thought should make you shudder. Because if your sales team is working outside of your CRM, that means you are getting no data on what's actually happening in your organization. You don't know who's in your deals, when they're in your deals, how you're interacting with those deals, who you're competing against, what the meetings is, what's the, we were just talking about it, what's the win plan? What's the, what's the win back or, or win plan for those deals, yeah, right? Yeah. It's a vicious circle, really. Yeah, you stop, you stop trusting the data and then you have less and less reliable data. Yeah. Brutal. Um, let's talk about 360 degree view of the customer. Everybody wants a 360 degree view of the customer, right? But only 26% of 26% of them do not have a 360 degree view of the customer. And in fact, those working in sales were actually 16% less likely than average to say that they do not, that they have a true 360 degree view of the customer. So only 20, 26% of people say, I don't have that view. There's no way for me to get that today. And even fewer of them, when you go to sales, are saying like, I don't know, I can't see everything I want to about the customer in one place. 22% um, are not getting the email campaign results they accept, expect. And 24% of our respondents say that their web forms don't capture accurate data in real time, right? Like that- A, a think quarter about of the demo requests, you have the, of the gold nuggets that you're getting. A quarter of the best of the best. There hasn't been a single organization that I have worked for that I have not had a moment when somebody in the sales department comes over and is like, I have this incredible insight for you, Kate. I got to tell you what it is. Okay, awesome. Tell me. The best converting leads that we have are people who filled out our contact us form. So all you have to do is get more of those, right? I, it, it happens at every single one of those Sydney. organizations. Ab absolutely. And if I could, there is nothing I would do more than find more people. Like that is what I wake up to do every day, get more people to fill out the contact us form. But 24% of people are saying those forms, like they cap, they don't capture accurate data. They don't do it in real time. It's yeah. too delayed, right? Because why I bet a big piece of that is because the systems, the real time piece is a huge part of this, like systems in real time, right? By the time you fill out the form, it gets into your marketing automation play. It goes through whatever uh, gets into your CRM. Then it goes through whatever lead routing system that you've mechanized. It's got to go through a lead scoring system that you've mechanized. It's, it's like all these things, right? Kicks off this super long process. And then this is the last part. I'll stop boring you with these stats, but I'm a huge data geek. So I, I could really could not see that. Could not see but uh, those people with the poor data quality are missing out on, on key growth opportunities. So those who rate the overall accuracy, quality, usefulness of the data in their CRM system as poor or very poor, were actually 34% less likely than those who rated their data as good or very good to say that data is the lifeblood of their company, right? And uh, a key growth driver. So, so in other words, people who say, hey, data is critical for us, it's our lifeblood, it's our... Um, it, and it's good, understand that this is how they're making money. Whereas people who are saying their data is of poor quality, it's just not there. They are not, they're saying like, that's not how we grow. We don't grow that way. We can't convert better. Like that's not how we're growing. We're not growing through data. The answer is right there for you, right? It's right there for you. I'm not saying it's simple, but it's right there in terms of how you can get growth, right? And then lastly, 20% of the, 20%, uh, those who rate the overall accuracy, quality, usefulness of their data in the CRM system as poor or very poor, were actually 20% less likely than those who rated it as good or very good to say their company uses data to differentiate themselves in a competitive advantage, right? So yet another way that those folks are losing and I love that data as a competitive advantage. I love that. What, how, I love that organizations are thinking about it that way, right? That it, they are running. And I think one of the ways that Mark, I know that marketers are doing that is like, 
my competitive advantages. I have this data so I can run sophisticated ABM campaigns, to these accounts that are a that really set my sales team up for high quality, uh, genuine conversations that I can grow the average contract value on these accounts through my ABM campaigns. And that is a differentiator for us. That's how we've changed the growth trajectory of our business, right? Like that is, uh, that is, pretty astounding to me but and i think if if your competitors are doing it like at some point you're forced to do it as well where you just stuck behind because they have the advantage exactly right because you're otherwise you're always a step behind right yeah, for sure. and it's like i'm constantly always trying to think how are we going to stay ahead of our competitors and and to the point of everything being about relationships i think the key about about building those relationships is showing somebody that you know them and how can you show somebody that you know them and understand their pain and have uh, sympathy and empathy for what they're going through and can help if you don't have the data or know anything about them? You can't, right? Yeah. And so that's why it's so important. Last one, I, I promise. 97% of people agree that inaccurate sales forecasts leads to incorrect operational budgeting, right? So now I'm, I, my data is inaccurate which is leading to inaccurate sales forecasts, which means that we are not budgeting accordingly, right? So that marketing isn't getting the budget they need, sales development isn't getting the budgeting they need because we are creating inaccurate sales forecasts. And eight out of 10 of people, eight out of 10 people agreed that budget based on inaccurate forecasts could lead to insufficient working capital, high turnover rates, and loss of shareholder value confidence. Yeah, so super like, important right now, especially as we plan for next year. Huge, huge, right? We're, I'm still like uh, polishing up that plan for next year and still working through a lot of the details there. But I mean, that is so enormous to me that this data is so important, so important to us because it's tied into those sales forecasts. And ultimately what happens there is like when we're inaccurate there, we lose shareholder confidence. We have turnover within the organization. We lose the best people in our organization and we just don't have the resources we need. Perfect. Uh, I think so. I'll, I'll take over, and there's also one more stat from from on my end. But really, like what we're going to sh show a little bit more, and what we've heard also here is just that high quality data is is really relevant for a lot of campaigns for go to market. So it's really not only about like, hey, I want to have good data in my CRM, but actually, what does this mean? And it's about uh, like, who do you reach? How who can you? Like, how can you define your ABM? Spend the time of your SDR team, of your marketing team most effectively. And then obviously the deliverability sender score. And I think the really interesting thing when you talk about, but like, actually about GDPR compliance, when you thought, talked about, um, I wanna have up-to-date data about the person so I can build a relationship. It's actually part of GDPR. Like you need to have up-to-date data about a person if you're collecting it. So very important here. And then on the user term side, go to market. I mean. We always say that user terms is fun for the whole organization. I think it, it totally applies for the for data in general. Like it's important for pretty much everyone in the organization. And on our end, we'll talk about like how this affects customer success, sales SDR, and then especially marketing uh, programs. Yeah, I love that. And the, the compliance piece there, Krishna, is so important, right? It's like, it's not just GDPR, it's like CCPA. And oh, yes. In, in the US, things are changing and evolving. I mean. We looked at a map uh, a couple of weeks ago, just in terms of where privacy regulations were coming out of. It's like, it's Nevada, it's Ohio, it's Florida, it's everywhere. And there's so many different levels of compliance. It's like, how do you make sure that you're adhering to all of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then few few statistics of mine that we've seen that we found really interesting is like, if you can, if, if there's a person that already purchased a product or used your product and they move these so-called alumni customers, then they are three times more likely. So Kate talked about like the very best lead sources. There's always the people that fill out the forms already indicate interest. The second one, or like very similarly is the one that already used your product. You reach out, you continue having this relationship. And then if we combine this actually with new executives, like if someone starts in, in a new role and specifically if they're in a leadership role, the first thing they do, I started my job, I'll evaluate like how's the current situation. That's what I do in the first month. And then I'll see what tools do I actually need to fulfill my goals. So in those first hundred days, I spent 70% of my budget. So in a sense, really 
regardless of whether you already have a relationship with them or not, this is the time where you want to check in as soon as possible. We all know like the uphill battle that we have if our competitors already in there, already built the relationship, and now we need to compete uh, against them. And then just interestingly, because it builds into this, if people are in a industry and function, then the majority of them actually stay in there. So this means if you're tracking people, the majority of them will actually join companies and industries that are again, interesting to you. Uh, these stats, when you when you had uh, initially shown these to me, like I couldn't believe that that 70% on the first 100 days. And then I st stepped back and I think I was actually in my 100 days when I was talking to you guys, I was like, I am that set. I, am that set. I looked at the back at 100 days and said, wow, I, yeah, I just spent a lot of money. But yeah, absolutely. It makes a ton of sense. Yes. And I think it's really interesting, like these first, let's say, 90 days, it's like first third is like I'm evaluating, I'm listening. Second third, second month is I'm, I'm thinking about what I need. Third month is when I'm buying. Yeah. yeah. So it's Love all it. about timing there. All right. Let's dive into the playbooks now, Christian, shall we? That sounds wonderful. All right, so I think I've got the first one. My first playbook is let's extend every marketing budget dollar. So here's a couple of facts, right? So overwhelmingly marketers are reporting that 2022 budgets are going down, not up. So that there is a, a recent report from Gartner that showed that uh, actually marketers, what had they had expected was that budgets from 2020 would actually go up in 2021. That did not happen. Actually, they went down 10%. And in 2022, I think they're, they're anticipated to drop another 20%. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think one of the primary reasons is throughout the last two years as marketers, we have learned all of these new ways that we can uh, grow our businesses that are more scalable than some of the things that 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 we all knew were like, I don't know if I should be going out and spending this $125,000 so that I can have this like super platinum white gold booth at this huge trade show so that 30,000 people can walk by and I can have my logo drop from the ceiling and, and like have a circus act in there. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure, but if I don't do it, my CEO is not going to be happy. And I think we were forced to go learn over these last two years maybe that's not a good idea. Like there's probably a better way, right? I think that's one of the reasons. Um, but it's the old do more with less, right? So a couple things that we have to start thinking about is the other stat was, the other um, fact was direct mail is making a comeback. There's, uh, there were some key stats around uh, somebody who actually interacts with a direct mail piece is actually two times more likely to have a conversation with you because they they've actually like felt it touched it feel like there's some thought that has gone into it right and now have this this bigger connection with you than uh than those who don't right and so direct mail is very much in play people are, are now in a pretty permanent space like I used to be locked down in my basement. That was a big jarring move, right? From where I was in downtown Boston. But now I'm back in Boston three days a week. I'm home two days a week. It's pretty, it's pretty consistent. So yeah, I think people have, have settled down. Now everybody's done moving from New York City to some town in Ohio where homing or housing prices have risen by like 400% or something. But you know, everybody's kind of settled in a little bit. And so we can get back to some of these things like direct mail that are really valuable key touch points for people that we want to really engage with. But you have to make sure because no CFO is walking in this door anyway with a bag of cash anytime soon. Um, I've got to make sure that I can get more out of the dollars that I had last year, right? And stretch them all the way. One of the ways to do that is make sure that you are cleaning your list before you do anything. We, I always think about campaigns like we, it all, everything starts with the who. Who are we targeting? Who are we trying to message to? Who are we trying to start a conversation with? And making sure that that data is clean and is ac in, and accurate, right? So biggest thing there is like, let's remove or merge our, all of our duplicates out of the mix right there. Because I don't want to spend $10 on a pack on no offense, Christian, I like you, but I don't want to spend two of my $10 packages to you, 
right? I want to get them, I want to get one to you and one to Trinity so I can really start that conversation and extend that dollar, right? So getting rid of duplicates, super important. I'll wait you for the let, package, Kate. <laughs> what's it? it? Uh, I'll wait I, for my package. I don't want to spoil that. <laughs> I got some GoPros in a cube down here that are going after some folks very soon. Oh, really? Yeah. So, um, so the other one, um, Let's remove inactives, right? You just had all of that data around the folks that are moving their jobs, how people are moving more than ever. Like, look, you are not doing yourself any favors by hoarding, by, be, by being a data hoarder in your organization. And what I mean by that is like, uh, my kids love to do this, right? It's like, oh, I have to have that toy that we bought for 10 tickets at whatever arcade we were at it's like the best thing ever never mind that like all the, the 75 other things but now my house is filled with all these little tchotchkes and i'm stepping on them right like we can never throw anything away don't take that mindset when it comes to data like if somebody is no longer at their organization if a contact record is no longer uh accurate if you have no signs of life they haven't been to your website in the last 12 months what are you, why are you holding that onto that? Like that's some precious amount of data. There's nothing ha happening there. Get rid of it, throw it out, right? Let, let's get rid of those folks that we know just like there's no sign of life there. Um, and then the next thing is let's verify your customer data. So now you know the who, you have a nice clean list of active people who you know are there that you have, that you know or uh, you can engage with. Now let's just make sure, let's verify that data for accuracy. So how are we uh, verifying both our email addresses as well as our, uh, as well as our uh, physical addresses, right? So making sure that the emails that we're gonna send out are gonna actually land in an inbox somewhere as well as those physical addresses too, uh, as well as those phone numbers. Why am I gonna set up my SDR team to call a phone number that's out of service, right? Like that's just wasted time, wasted minutes. And every single one of those is gonna add up. So let's make sure our data is clean and ready to go, right? And so get- what do you do, like, what, are, what are best practices, like specifically for people addresses? So for them. people for people addresses, uh, we definitely do it uh, on a per campaign basis. So like before we're sending anything uh, from an email perspective, we are doing that every time uh, Every time we open a record, we're verifying so that I, so that my SDR sales team, customer success team, every time we open that record, we can hit our API and verify that address and say, "Yep, this is still valid. Like you can, you 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 can still use this one." We do the same thing for phone numbers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a question from from the chat. Thank you. Love it. Um, second tip, my second playbook. Um, is protect your sender reputation. So um, what I mean by sender reputation is essentially uh, as an email sender, as all of us in marketing are, right? We have this opportunity. Uh, we have essentially like kind of like a credit score of our domain, of both our domain and our uh, IP address, right? And that score is calculated based on a, a number of different factors, but it's based on the number of complaints that you get from mail from your mailbox providers. It's based on uh, opt out information. It's based on uh, where you're landing in inboxes, like if you're landing in the spit, how many spam filters you're hitting. It's based on the number of traps that you could be hitting, which are addresses that people have created like on purpose yeah. knowingly that like and they put on websites somewhere so that they can detect who what companies may be scraping websites for contact information and building their crm that way so there's a number of different factors it's based on uh how your open rate data uh from your mailbox providers how people open your mail how many people actually click in and engage with your mail how many people even respond to your mail so all of those factors go into your score right and so that score is super important because it then it goes back and informs all of those mailbox providers like Google, like Microsoft, like Yahoo, uh, all of those all of those mailbox providers about what you are like if you are a reputable sender or not. 
And just like a credit score, as your score goes down, then guess what? Those filtering, filtering algorithms are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And actually what we've seen is that those filtering algorithms uh, year over year got 9% tighter, right? We, got, we saw a 9% decrease in inbox placement rates across all across uh, all of the industries. And then we actually saw, but what we could, because, and that is because of one thing, we saw a 94% increase year over year in the amount of email sent. 94% increase. I'm not surprised uh, about this, but the 9%, I mean, that that is shocking. Like if you don't, yeah. if you don't change anything, it means like a 10th of your message doesn't get delivered anymore. And that every year. Yeah. Yep. And what we saw is, and this was, this is a bit dated stat. We've got to get this. I'm really excited to look at. Um, this, but the benchmark for what we call like subscriber churn there is about 25 to 33%. So when we say subscribers, we just mean your email list, right? The folks on your email list, they're churning at about 25 to 33% all the time all the time for a lot of the reasons that we talk about here that you've talked about right a big one is the great resignation and i actually think that number is going to spike even more yeah, for sure um so those are some of the facts right that's actually what we're seeing so that's why your your sender reputation is so important to you and so what you can do to protect it is first and foremost i think I think what marketers have done over the last two years has been incredibly impressive in, in that going, making giant leaps in digital transformation, right? Making these vast, huge improvements to their overall programs, uh, having to pivot their plans completely in, in the drop of a hat, right? Has been, and we've had to do that over and over and over again. That wasn't just something that happened in March of uh, 2020, right? That actually happened over and over and over again. As every time we thought, oh, the world's opening back up, we can do in-person events. Oh, no, just kidding. Uh, Boris just closed the UK down. Oh, the world's opening back up. Oh, no, we can't. Omicron's here, right? Like that, it just happens. Oh, it's happened over and over and over and over again. And so uh, I have a lot of empathy for all the marketers in the world that have done that. One of the things that we did was we added new channels like SMS. And as direct mail has come back on, so now we've got email, we've got SMS, we've got direct mail, we've got all these channels. But one of the things that we haven't done as marketers is actually like blow off some of the dust on that preference center we built roughly about 1999, which was the last time we ever looked at it, right? And because everybody was like, oh, okay, let's build a preference center. Uh, that, that's when they were big. In the meantime, your consumers have been using that preference center to tell you what they want and you're not adhering to that. And so you now, you know, lots of companies now, and even in my own personal life, it's like, do you want to sign up for shipping updates via SMS? Yeah, sure. I didn't say, I, I said I wanted shipping updates. I didn't say I wanted to know about your sale next week, right? Like I didn't get, I, I didn't tell you that. So that's what I mean by learn your subscribers' preferences and follow them, right? Like dust, blow some dust off of that preference center. Let's get clear about what channels you are going to use as a marketer, what you are going to use them for, and what you're going to allow your, the people, your recipients to tell you about how they want to hear about it, right? Um, second, we talked, I talked a little bit about this too in the last one, but understanding where there's signs of life and be willing to say goodbye to where there aren't, right? And so, Look, you can't rely on open rate data anymore because Apple's mail privacy protection feature that they just put in is skyrocketing everybody's open rates. And that proxy is really opening your mail, not actually a human yeah. on the other side, right? And so you can't rely on open rate data. That's not good enough. What you can rely on is data around web visits. And when you know somebody has actually visited, rely on your own zero party data, right? Like, and also, and second party data where appropriate, but when you're looking at signs of life, please rely on like, hey, this is what's actually happening. This is from a vendor I trust, like user gem. So I know that this is happening. I know this person's still good. I know they're in there, right? But rely on your own data to also tell you like, yeah, this person's been visiting my website. They're still in. I can hold on to this person. Where it's like, hey, I haven't heard or seen from this person. We haven't had any activity from this person in 18 months, throw it out, get rid of it, archive it. You don't need it. You do not need to be sending to it. It is negatively impacting that sender mm -hmm. reputation for sure. Yeah. Um, and also 
I talked about your sender reputation. One of the indicators in there was like, how do people interact with your email? How do they, how do they open it? How, because your mailbox provider knows when a human is actually opening it versus when uh, the Apple proxy is opening it. How do they open it? How do they read it? How much time do they spend in your message? How many times do they click through it? And how do they reply to it? So instead of, imagine this as marketers, instead of just sending an email and being like, click this button to go do this thing and never talk to a human, what if you asked for a reply? What if you said, what is your biggest marketing challenge in 2022? How is your budget coming along, right? Like ask for a human reply to start a conversation with somebody on your team. Like, gosh, that seems like such an earth shattering move, right? But like, why not? Why not make it that simple? So give your subscribers a reason to talk to, to speak with you. And then the last one is find a solution that tells you more than, yep, we delivered your mail, which is like, yes, an SMTP message went from this server to that server. But where is that mail delivered? Like, it, did you get in the inbox? Are you sitting in a, in a spam filter? Are you in the promotions tab? Where are you? Because that's what matters. And there's so much more beyond that, just that delivered set. But Kristen, give us, tell, tell me more about these playbooks. What do you guys have? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, like what you just shared, I always think about leverage, like what my actions, what can I do, like small things that I do to get a lot out of it. And I think the sender reputation is one of the things that if I don't do them, then it means that I'm like losing half of whatever I'm doing. So it's yeah. important. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Let's jump to the next one. Uh, oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, perfect. Thank you. So for us, um, like when we think about um, talking about marketing, priorities in a sense we talk about abm and abx account prioritization and this is such an important topic for us we always we want to have these trigger signals of who who are we going after like what accounts should we prioritize and whenever we prioritize it means we put a lot of dollars behind we have marketing spend we have sdrs going after these accounts so um where we look at is like what are really good signals for us and signals in this case means um on the person level so there could be that actually a a previous champion joins a company or a company hires a new leadership person. And this means for us, these are the signals that should influence and I should uh, like elevate these accounts into my AB, uh, ABM prioritization list. And one and so many of the reasons like what we already talked about, like if an account has a new executive, they are now evaluating which tools they should be buying. So this means um, it's, it's, it's especially them, but this means that they talk to other people in the organization. You should not only target them, but pretty, but actually the whole organization go after uh, and like, go after the whole organization and more and more. It's important that like these, the cold emails, I think that the response rate are dropping every single year. Similarly, there's so many statistics of what is dropping every year and response rates to cold emails are as well. So the more I can make them warm and warm is like, there's a trigger event on the person, the better. And the tips that we've seen, the things that work really well is so the that your paid ads go directly after accounts where someone either switched into this account and is now in a leadership role or got promoted into this leadership role. Once again, coming back to the 7%. Ultimately, we can expect if there's a new leader that a lot of things in the organization will be questioned. And we want to be part of that conversation. I love that, Christian. I think that's so important, right? Because so many times when when we are looking at our own closed loss deals, it was because we didn't understand somebody had veto power somewhere, right? And so yes. the fact mm -hmm. that you can provide like that data in terms of like, hey, just an FYI, somebody's coming in and they're going to have veto power on this deal. You need to bring them in, right? And yeah. we're constantly coaching. And I think Forrester has a stat like buyer committees are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every year, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And then there is movement in those buyer committees, like 40% of my buyer committee are changing this year. So even more important, I know everyone who are the stakeholders, bring everyone in. I think obviously that that has been the sales tip since forever, but once again, it has never been as important as this year. And yeah, target the whole, like it's either the department, if it's an enterprise, or target the whole organization. You know, yeah. this is a trigger event. And then I think it's just, it, uh, it just bears repeating that, I think we're back to three, just it right. always has to be in collaboration with sales. Like marketing selects the accounts, the, and a similar message than what is used with the ads 
should be used by the sales team as they go after the person that changed and uh, their colleagues. Now we can go to the next one. Yes, and so, and this one is, um, so the previous one was focused on your ABM effort, like the account selection who you should go after. Very, very important in that play is also that actually what, um, how can you, uh, if a previous customer joined a new company, like this, this movement of someone that bought my product or used my product before joins a new company. And we call it a warm lead. That's someone that already knows the organization. You definitely want to reach out directly to that person. That comes back to like keeping the relationship. And this means like, we've seen um, congrats in the subject line is always awesome for, for open rates. It also is if they are a past champion, they already know the product. We have, a, have seen up to 5x um, response rate to these emails than to any other email. And importantly, the way we see it is like, ultimately it's a relationship, which means it's not, I, it, I can try to go in and say like the first step is it actually doesn't have a call to action. It's just a congrats. Like they're getting situated in their new role. Congratulate them on the change. Um, include maybe some gifting elements because it is a big step in their life, right? Like so much just changed. Um, it's important for us to understand what's going on. And then as they've evaluated their situation, now it's about, okay, can we maybe help you with your goals in your new organization, similarly to how we did it before? And one very, very important thing that we learned is that obviously I want to do this for every decision maker that ever bought my product. Like the people in the opportunity, they are super, super important because they can buy again. But what we found is so important is that the individual end users, the people that probably actually then really use my product, um, sometimes they don't have decision making power. They might not even have it at the new company, but this can actually be my influences. So this means even if this is the end user, I would reach out to them, I congratulate them. I once again, keep this relationship. And then this person can help me navigate the organization, find the right buyer for me. And we have, um, we have some examples here, just how you um, reach out in a very, very personalized way, mentioning the old company. So it, it, it's a very personalized message and once again like maybe add some gift as a as a congratulations on that and then i love this, that i love this touch point christian because it's so it is like it is exactly what we've been talking about around building relationships right it's yeah. like hey hey christian is like it's great that you were over at acme corp and now you're at beta corp man like congratulations great move for you like don't forget about us we're here for you no matter yeah. what right i yeah. think that's that's so yeah. so key yeah, once again, the LTV of the person. And I think so much in B2B marketing, as you said, like we still sell to humans. So I think we, more and more we want to have the B2C elements of like this relationship with the individual in our B2B marketing and sales. Great. Um, and then this is, a, this is also a very interesting one. So previously we talked about customers changing their job. But at the same time, we have a lot of people that we have ever been in touch. Like they were part of an opportunity they evaluated our product. They might even right now evaluate our product and be in a sales conversation, but they can change the job. I think that's what I really saw over the last few months with the great resignation turned into something real when I saw how many like, ongoing opportunities, for example, had a person leaving. And in our case, if we evaluate the opportunities that didn't turn into a win, we can look into, was this person a champion? And it, maybe it just didn't work out because it was the wrong organization. Like, too small, too large, or it was a um, like just a different priority. But at their new company, as long as they're a fan at the new company, it could be the right fit. So very much evaluating this as well. And then very interestingly also, if, if, if we can identify who was the blocker, then we can actually use this to say, okay, this person now left. And we often get this information. We get something like, hey, unfortunately, this person vetoed the deal and it's off. Like we can track them, but we don't reach out at the new company, but rather we actually reach out at the old company and, and see that it's now a good time to, to reevaluate. I love that idea of like getting that now, like the person who, who lost that deal for you is out, like great time to go re-engage and figure out how you push that over. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need, that means like a little bit the sales team needs to track that, but yeah, that, this is a wonderful opportunity um, to, to, to start that opportunity again. And uh, we've got a question there, I think that fits in um, several of these, but the question is, in terms of reaching out, um, 
it, it's very different and based on persona, like depending on title or seniority. And so what we've seen is specifically, like when we talk about the difference between the person that can make the, the decision, can make, can, like has the budget uh, versus the end user. And we've seen, as mentioned, like for the decision maker, I would really would go in early, say hi, and then um, as we said, in the second month, they evaluate the situation. That's when I want to be part of the conversation. Versus for an end user, it could actually be they need to first establish themselves in the organization. They need to get to know the right people so that they can help us work, um, uh, go through the, the organization, uh, navigate the organization. So that means for an end user, it could also be that I'm waiting a little bit longer. It could be that maybe it's not after 30 days, but it's, it's rather like give them two months and then I'll reach out and, um, and then ask them, um, who could be the right person for me to chat with. And then talking about this, uh, the, the last one, this is actually really interesting because it, um, it makes this use case actually much bigger. Because what I can do here is there are, if I have a large list of customers, I have obviously like a select, selected list of people that use my product, but actually um, I can use the knowledge that, they, that this person who just changed, who just joined my target account, they previously worked at a customer and they might not have used my product, they might have heard about it. Um, I can use that knowledge and reach out in a very warm and personalized way. And once again, this comes down to what we need to, in a sense, work against is the dropping response rates of cold emails. So the more we can make cold emails warm, the higher the response rate. So in this case, if I see this person previously worked at a customer, then I can reach out, hey, maybe you didn't, like your experience at the previous company. Um, where it's like already subject line is personalized. And then I can acknowledge like, hey, um, saw that you worked here. You might have not used our product, but actually your previous company was very successful. Here's a little bit of information. Like this is the ROI that they saw. Um, could this be interesting at your new company? Once again, um, very personalized way ultimately leads to a better response rate. And then the last playbooks that we don't go into detail because it's not directly related to marketing, but it actually, like, as mentioned, this data could be really useful for everyone in the organization. So it's like, as mentioned, for account executive, in an ongoing deal, someone leaves, I want to know this as quickly as possible, prevent, uh, prevent, uh, like, uh, prevent deal risk, or someone joins an account with an open opportunity. That's amazing. I want to bring these people together. They can tell them how successful they were previously. So that actually really accelerates deals. And then similarly on customer success, account management side, it's all about churn prevention. The, if my champion leaves, then the champion leaving is actually the number two reason for churn. And oftentimes, like especially the ones that not so happy customers are the ones where I don't hear that this person leaves. So the earlier I know about this, uh, the more time I have to save the deal, maybe resell to the new person that just replaced them. So really it's all about timing and knowing this information as early as possible. Similarly, account management, like that, that's cross-sell across the organization. Uh, if I'm working with the Microsoft of the world and I have someone join a different department, that's amazing for me. I can now sell to that department as well. Yeah, I love that. Love that, it's so good. All right, we've got, Man, we've got QR codes, which I which I love. I'm so excited about this. Um, but so free for you, because you all have given us your most precious asset, which is your time and your data, but definitely your time, because we only we all only get 24 hours in a day. But thank you for spending your time with us, uh, first and foremost. But we wanted to at Validity, we wanted to give you, we just published this Are You Ready for AI uh ebook? It's specifically thinking about uh if you're using data and feeding it into AI, AI is like the new silver bullet, right? Everybody's go, oh, there's always one silver bullet and everybody's talking about AI right now. But the idea is if you train that AI on dirty data, uh, your AI isn't going to be very good. And so this is this is an ebook that we wrote to help you kind of prepare and how, how you need to think about that before you go down the AI track. And, and then Christian, on the user gem side, you guys have this awesome guide. What, what's that about? Yeah, um, and I have to say, like, I need to check out that that uh, the, the the guide about the AI. I think this is really interesting for us as well. Yeah, and on our end, um, it's a guide about like, what all the playbooks we we just shared, and and even a little bit more together with real examples of how you can reach out to past champions, to these companies, to their colleagues, to the company the person left. Basically, all the playbooks we talked to in in much more detail. 
Love it. Love it. All right. Christian, such a pleasure to spend spend time with you. Trinity, thank you so much for being our our master coordinator, making sure we get these questions in front of us and everything else like that. Any parting thoughts, Christian? Should have prepared for this question. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw it back to you. No parting thoughts here. Uh, I hope everybody has an amazing end to, to 21. May we all hit our bookings targets. May we all uh, and, and go home prior to Christmas thinking about what an incredible year this was and uh, waiting for our bonus checks and all, and all the good things that, that come as that. But uh, thanks so much, Christian, Trinity. I will talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Take care.